All right, so our next speaker is uh, got home court advantage here. You already know who he is, but I want to tell you who he is to us, to me and Taylor. We met him uh, it was about a year ago, I guess. Why not? We met briefly four or five years ago, but seriously started talking last year. Yeah, I mean, seriously talking. Uh, he's been a guest on our show, the Blue Collar Proud Show. In fact, he is going to be the guest on the episode that releases tomorrow uh, morning. So if you want to hear, uh, get a double dose of, the, of uh, Tim, then you can listen uh, tomorrow morning uh, on that episode. I love it when I get a chance to tell people that millennials rock and then prove it by introducing people like this guy. He is the future. Things are changing, and this guy is bringing, up the, uh, bringing everybody up to speed. I, I'm looking forward to what he's got to say, and I'm even better, just even more glad that uh, I get to call you a friend and, and uh, have you on our team. Thanks, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Reed. Appreciate that. There's a serious problem in our industry. Companies are losing thousands of dollars every year with poor marketing spends. Anyone disagree with that? Sales is getting harder and harder, right? The web's creeping in, and dealers are getting squeezed from both sides, both from consumers and from manufacturers. Now, if that wasn't enough, on top of that, we've talked about this all day today, that good people just aren't around. I mean, people aren't knocking on our doors for a job to get hired, um, and the old generation is starting to fade out, and there are not people to come up and take those places in our industry. It, I mean, it, that's really what's going on. What I want to talk about today, though, is that there's hope. And while many businesses are struggling from these things, it doesn't have to be you. There are things you can do to take control and move the needle in regards to sales, to marketing, and to retaining good talent. So that's what we're going to talk about today. This is going to be a lot less formal. I, I spoke about this in Nashville a few weeks ago at HPBA. Um, that was a big audience and it was really formal. This is going to be really informal, so feel free to jump in, push back, raise hands, ask questions. But we're going to go through a lot when it comes to this. Now, the first thing I'm going to say is this, is that by the end of today, here's the goal, is that number one, you're going to learn how to take control of your marketing dollars. Number two is going to be how to train your sales team for the current landscape, because the landscape's changed. For those of you that heard me last year, we talked a lot about that, that the landscape has changed and it only will continue to change. If you haven't been affected by it yet, you will. Lastly is going to be how to retain talent and convert them into brand ambassadors. That that's the goal for every company, to grow employees for life that love what you do and that represent your brand. So here's my argument, and you might think I'm crazy, but I'm going to tell you that 90% of the marketing dollars that most companies in our industry spend is wasted. It's completely wasted, and I don't care if you're a manufacturer, if you're a distributor, if you're a retailer. I'm going to say that 90% of those dollars are wasted. There's a few reasons why. The biggest one is companies are spending an astronomical amount of money on traditional advertising, whether it's print, TV, radio, home shows, without proper tracking, the way that Taylor talked about today. Just blind spending. Those traditional means are becoming just astronomical, I mean they're already expensive, but astronomically more expensive. And companies are not tracking what they're spending. Second thing is that websites are not set up to properly help customers. We can get into this more as we, as we keep talking, but the reality is we do not understand how complicated our websites are. They are immensely complicated and consumers have no grasp of what we do by the way that we portray our websites. And again, this is manufacturers, retailers, and distributors. No one's exempt from this. The last part is that we confuse a lot of people with sales copy and messaging. It's just not spoken in the way that consumers think and feel. So we're going to talk about that. Um, the first thing is this, is that, is that you know, we want to spend good marketing dollars, obviously. I mean, the whole thing with marketing is that when you spend money, you want to get a return on your investment. If you don't get a return on the investment, then, I mean, there's a lot of more fun things I could do than thinking of like buying TV ads, right? And that's the truth for all of us, right? We're only doing this because there's an ROI on it. So we have to be laser focused with our marketing. Um, as, as we drill into this, we're going to hit websites first. And I'm so big on this, is that, is that if, as we start to talk here today, you're going to hear me say clarity and simplicity and easy over and over and over and over. Because that's what we have to have. And it, it translates to marketing, it translates to sales, and it actually translates to the way that we retain talent in our company. 
We need clarity, we need it to be easy, and we have to speak just in, in a way that uh, is, is really simple to understand. So here's something, on our websites, when a customer goes to our website, it needs to pass the five second test. Within five seconds, a customer on our website needs to know, number one, what products and services we offer, number two, how it will make their lives better, and number three, what they need to do to buy. And if a customer doesn't know all three of those things within five seconds, they're gonna hit the back button and find someone else that can answer it for them. Those three. And here's the whole thing, it's like we can't be cute. I mean, I, I see this all the time because I'm, I'm kind of a website snob and I, you know, I like to check out these different, these different websites and you know, in, in different industries and stuff, but, but you always see this stuff on websites like you know, uh, delivering the finest quality products since 1935 or you know, we, we specialize in excellence. And like, what does that mean? I mean, I, I mean if a consumer goes to a, a web page, like, you know, what, I mean, it sounds cute, but it actually doesn't mean anything. And with so much noise today, I mean, we're bombarded with ads and marketing and, I mean, every day you flip open your smartphone, you flip open your email, there are so many ads that we're being bombarded with every day that it's no longer the most creative ad that wins. It's the ad with the most simplicity and the most clarity that wins. And that's what we need is we need to take a big step back to simplicity and clarity. And I'm really big on this, particularly with our web pages, because, you know, blue collar businesses don't have huge marketing budgets traditionally. And this is something that it doesn't take a big marketing budget, it just takes a little bit of thought and a little bit of care. And this is kind of like what Taylor talked about in Carter, that the stuff like this is hard, but I would way rather work hard on simplifying a message on my website that cost me virtually nothing to do than work really hard trying to buy $50,000 worth of TV that's probably not gonna work, right? I mean, that's, I, would, I would way rather work hard on stuff that's gonna win an investment back for me over time. So anyway, um, the five second test on a website, it is so important that when you go to a website, you understand those three things. Number one, what do you do? Number two, why is it gonna make your customers' lives better? And number three, what do they need to do to buy? You know, this doesn't mean you have to sell online, but maybe you want them to come into your store. Maybe you want to schedule an appointment. Maybe you want them to fill out a form. There's, there's something like that on your website that it needs to pass that five second test. And, and a really good test for this, because we get so blinded to it, because like, we see our website every day, or you know, hopefully you see your website every day, you're checking it and stuff like that, but we get totally blind to it. And a, a crazy test, if you want to, is next time you're at Starbucks or you know, anywhere you've got a computer, literally just go find a random person, tap them on the shoulder and say, can you do me a huge favor? I wanna, sh I wanna show you my website. And I just wanna ask you a couple questions. Literally pull it open, show it to them, five seconds, close the computer, and ask, what, what products and services do I offer? You'll, you'll be shocked at how many people don't know that you sell fireplaces because there's a picture of something on your website that's not a fireplace. How will it make their lives better? A lot of people don't know that, right, when they first go to your web page. How, I mean, how does it make their lives better? If they don't know in that, that first five seconds, chances are they're gonna hit the back button and find someone else that tells them easier. And then number three, this is the biggest one, is do consumers know what they need to do to buy after going to your website? Website simplification is something that is so low cost. And for me, you know, as, as, as I run uh, my business, you know, you're always off after something low cost. And, and, and we all get co-op dollars and things like that from manufacturers, and that's great. But the reality is like, just because you get those dollars doesn't mean that you have to spend them on traditional advertising and marketing, right? I mean, and there's low hanging fruit that we can go after that's gonna be really, really simple. And so the first thing is just that website simplification that Generally speaking, if, if, we, if we think about the, the scope of business with a customer, the website is really like the first date, isn't it? I mean, I would, I would argue, this is true for me, and I don't know if it's true for you guys, but I would imagine it is, that 90% of customers that find you have found your website first. I mean, the website is really the first date. But for us, this is really funny, is that you know, if we go back to, to what a customer really needs to know right away, is if you think about a first date, and you know, we've all probably been on one before, and you think about like all the information that we try to cram into our web pages, right? I mean, what, if you've got a good web page, man, it's full of brochures and BTUs and framing dimensions and architect specs, right? And we get really like, we kind of puff our chests up about that. And so we have the most information on our web page. But the way I think about that would be like, if you went on a first date with someone and like, you know, first date, hey, my name's Tim, how are you doing? Oh, it's so nice to meet you. Let me tell you about all my ex-wives. I have so much relational baggage. Let me just, let me just unload everything that I've, I've ever had in relationship history and just vomit it on you right now, right? I mean, that's not what you do on a first date, right? But like, I mean, think about this, like what, what, what do you do on a first date? Like, what's the goal? 
Get a second date. Yeah, get a second <laughs> date, right? I mean, I mean, it's hopefully to look good, to show that you're competent, you know, carry on a conversation, and then you win the second date. So as we're going through looking at our marketing, number one, the sole function of our web page is to win a second date. That's the sole function of it. And there's different ways that you can play that. But if your website is not geared to win you a second date, then your company is losing money. The question though is, sure we all want to get a second date, right? So we all want them to maybe send us an email or to come into the showroom or to give us a call. But the question is this, is that you, know, you can spend I mean, as much money as you want driving traffic to your web page. And I would argue, this goes back to what Carter just hit on, that most companies in, in a marketing scenario do not have a web traffic problem and they do not have a door swing problem. Most companies don't. Most companies have a sales problem and a tracking problem. So if you look at this, um, if your website is simplified and it's in a position to win a second date, the question that we all need to be asking is, how do I even know if I want a second date, right? I mean, someone goes to your, if so, I mean, honestly, if someone goes to your website, you know, maybe they come into your store, maybe they don't, but what we need to do is, is you actually have to start auditing your web traffic, like Taylor's talking about. You need to have a, whether it's a form on your website to fill out for an estimate, or a call to action to make a phone call. There's, there's things that you can do to actually start to track how people are coming in, and to actually win names, email addresses, and customer information from your website. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Does, does that make sense, website simplification? Am I out in left field with that? Not at all. I mean, and it's so, you know, I always use my wife as the example, but like, if I go pull up manufacturer's, Manufacturer X's website and go hand it to my wife, and I say, you know, because we did a remodel pretty recently, we put a fireplace in, and I go hand to the computer and say, hey, which fireplace should we get? I mean, just imagine that as a consumer. You have no idea what a framing clearance is. You have no idea what a BTU is. And yet you go to a manufacturer's website and you're blasted with engineer level terminology. And it just doesn't make any sense for a consumer. Something to think about. Another reason why uh, marketing dollars are wasted is because, generally speaking, companies don't audit their spends the way that they should. And this has actually been something for me that has changed a lot. And it goes back to what I said originally, that I, I really believe that 90% of the marketing dollars spent in our industry are wasted. And again, that's on a company-to-company -company basis. There's some companies that are doing it really well, but I would say that with most companies, I could, I could go in and cut 90% of your spending and you wouldn't see anything change with your sales. And the reason I say that is because I've done that myself. I, we did that about four years ago. We cut 90% out and we've grown sales every year since then. So here's the thing though. The way that you do that is you have to audit your spends hard. I don't know if you guys saw who wrote that quote. It was your hard-earned dollars that said that. <laughs> audit, your, audit your spends hard. That, that's what you have to do. So, so again, this is both digital and this is physical. So digital, I mean, all of you guys should have a website and access to some kind of you know, Google Analytics or something to find out how people are coming to your site, how much time they're spending on it, which pages are they spending the most time, because that's gonna start to help you organize the content of your website. And it's okay if you know, maybe you're a little bit older, you have a harder time with this, there are people out there that can help you with it and most likely you have a younger niece or nephew or friend or someone that has a kid that knows it. Like this stuff is not rocket science but it's, it's basic stuff that's really gonna move the needle in your business. Um, someone asked a question a little bit earlier today about if we are you know, being forced into the digital age and like the reality is that we're there and it's not going back. I mean, the, Industry has changed so much in just the last 10 years. And I, I mean, we have not even scratched the surface of what the smartphone's gonna do and Google Home and Siri and I mean, we have not scratched the surface. So if you think it's changed a lot, it's gonna change a lot more in the next five to 10 years. But the good thing is that you can be on top of that and you can be proactive with it to win in this changing landscape. You just have to prepare for success. If you're not preparing for it, you know, you're never gonna be able to capitalize on it when things actually move. Um, so uh, going back to auditing your spends, highly recommend some kind of access to Google Analytics that's checked at least on a monthly basis. And it doesn't take a ton of time, but maybe an hour or two with someone that can explain this, that can teach you about it. Like Taylor said, I mean, these guys are really good. If you email Taylor, he does a site review, you know, they can get you set up at a reasonable budget to be able to really start to move the needle on this stuff with your company. But the point is that there are people out there and I mean, at least for me, like, I'm not a brain surgeon. Like I just typed into Google, how do I track analytics on my web page? I mean, honestly, like it's amazing what, what Google can do for you. Um, but you have to track it. In the same way, 
we need to be tracking door swings. I remember last year uh, in Vancouver, I asked the question, how many businesses were actively tracking their door swings? And there was one person that raised their hand. And you think, how much, how much money do you guys spend on marketing every year? I mean, traditionally, maybe like three, five percent. I mean, that's like, that's a crap load of money, right? And so to not track how people are coming in there and just to blindly spend money is stupid. I mean, honestly, and this is hard. Like this stuff says easy, like it's easy to say, oh yeah, you just gotta track your door swings, right? But that actually, that's, that's a culture thing. I mean, because it's not, I mean, unless you're gonna sit at the front counter all day and log that stuff, right? You need some buy-in from other people. So this goes back to what Taylor and Carter have been talking about, that we need to lead cultures. We need to build a culture of accountability and a, a, a culture of buy-in. And it's really important to get your team to buy in on this stuff because it will move the needle in your company. You know, when you start to look for, why is my business losing money? I just, I feel like I'm not, like I'm just treading water. I'm just, I'm, I'm sawing away, but I'm not cutting down the tree. I mean, when that stuff happens, a lot of that money is hidden in poor marketing spends. It's just the truth. So I just, I want to encourage you guys that there's things you can do both digitally and physically, but it would be, it would be well worth getting some kind of system in place to track your door swings because it, it starts to give you power. An example of this is like, you know, for me, um, I know every customer that comes in my door. I know what they looked at. I know who they talked to. I know their close percentage. And I mean, like, it's just, it's just been built in, into our system. It's not rocket science. It's something that's really easy to do. It just takes dedication and follow through. But when you start to have that data, it gives you power and credibility when you actually are going to advertise. So when you are going to make uh, a marketing spend, this is an example a couple years ago. We had a guy coming in, and he was trying to sell us $50,000 worth of TV. And I don't know about you guys, but you know, 50,000 bucks is a lot of money for me, right? I mean, it's a ton of money. So this guy's trying to sell us 50,000 bucks of TV. And so we're talking through, and he's giving, oh, you're gonna get so many impressions, and you know, these are gonna be the age groups that we're gonna target and everything. And, and I just said, you know, hey, that's awesome. I'm glad we're gonna get that, but what can I expect for a return on my investment? And how soon can I expect that? And like, there was no answer. And he goes, he goes it doesn't work that way. And I was like, wait, so you want me to spend $50,000 and, and you're going to say that it doesn't work that way to ask what the return on my investment is. I mean, I, I mean imagine, imagine if, you, if your financial advisor told you that, right? And you're like, well, wait, where, where should I invest my 401k? Where, you know, what's the return on my... And they're like, oh, no, it doesn't work that way. You, you, just, you just invest it. Like, I mean, they wouldn't have a job. Is that fair? That's fair? Is that fair? But how often do we do that with marketing, whether it's print or radio or TV or home shows? I mean, all this stuff. So I'm not saying necessarily that TV's bad. I am telling you it's ridiculously overpriced. Like it is so freaking overpriced, there's a million other things you can do that are more effective, but it's not bad in and of itself, unless you don't track it, right? So if you, if you take a calculated risk and say, okay, we're gonna spend X amount of dollars in TV, and we expect that we're gonna get a return on our investment in this time, right? And it doesn't have to be the next month, but maybe it's the next six months, right? And, and you, you execute it, you track it, you plan it, and at the end of six months you go, hey, was that a good investment? Was that a bad investment? You know, maybe we missed, maybe we got it, Maybe, you know, maybe we set the wrong time frame. Maybe we need to make it 12 months, right? But the point is that you're establishing a system that's calculated and proven, and that's going to start to build success over time because you're going to start to learn what works and what doesn't work. Does that make sense? Auditing, auditing those media spends really hard. Like, I can't stress how important that is. So once, once we've simplified our website to talk to customers in a way that makes sense to them and show them really easily those three things, once we've done that and we've established a system of both digital tracking, I mean digital door swings and physical door swings to find out how people are coming to us, what's working, what's not working, the next step is that we have to create clear and simple messaging. And this is so hard. So like, you're gonna hear me, I get excited about this stuff. Can you guys tell? <laughs> I, I, get, I get fired up. So you know, this is, this is me at like a six right now. I might, I might get to an eight by the time we're done today. But I get fired up about this stuff, okay? So here's the thing with simple and clear messaging. We don't understand how much knowledge we have. And we don't understand how difficult it is to buy a fireplace. You know, going back to my remodel project, you know, when I pulled up that manufacturer's website and handed my wife the computer, I mean, it was like a deer in the headlights, right? So here's what we have to do. Everything that we do comes back to this, that we fight the curse of knowledge. If you, if you Google this name, there's a person called Lee Lefevre, and they talk about the curse of knowledge. And this is what the curse of knowledge is, right? So, you know, I could probably point to any one of you guys, and you're a hearth expert. You know, you've been doing this for a long time, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and you can tell me everything I need to know about gas pressure, BTUs, framing clearances. I mean, like, you can really get down and talk, you know, 
dirty fireplaces with me. I mean, like, you know, because we pride ourselves on that, right? We pride ourselves on being the hearth expert. But this is the problem. We talk at a nine or a 10. When we try to make it simple for customers, we might be able to get it down to a six or a seven. Customers buy at a one or a two. The companies that can speak at a one or a two are the companies that win. We always have to remember that. Speak at a one or a two. Talk to your customers like someone would talk to you if you'd never seen a fireplace before in your life, right? So someone walks into your store. I mean, I've seen this all the time, you know. And, uh, or maybe you go into a, you know, a competitor store and you're doing some secret shopping. And you say, hey, I need to get a fireplace. And they look at you and they go, well, how many square feet you got? And you go, uh, I, 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 yeah, I got 1,500 square feet. Okay. Do you need a, uh, do you got a masonry or a ZC? I mean, like, what's a, what's a customer, what's a customer say to that, right? I mean, but like, we, but we do this. I mean, we do, and if you don't do it, there's someone on your team that does. I mean, that's just the truth, right? We got to speak at a one or a two. We also, in everything we do as far as with our marketing, we have to answer the question, why will this solve your problem, right? This goes back to, you know, whether it's in it, you know, you can see TV ads or print ads that are, that are just saying, hey, you know, we've been delivering quality for over 40 years. Great. It doesn't mean anything to a consumer, right? How does it solve their problem? We need to speak simply, right? Is your house cold? We can make it comfortable, right? I mean, like, that's spoken in the language of a consumer. And we have to get out of our own heads because it's so hard for us being just, we get tunnel vision because we're ingrained in it every single day. And, and to, uh, Troy talked about this, to Troy's point, you know, for us, like we could be so flippant, flippant about a gas insert, right? For us, oh yeah, it's just a, they just bought a crappy gas insert. It doesn't, it was just a you know, little sale, whatever. But think about that from the consumer's perspective, right? I mean, for this consumer, even for a low end gas insert, they probably spent three grand. I mean, who knows, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, but like, that's, that's an investment. I mean, for a lot of folks, that's like, I mean, that's a big purchase. And, and we, we're so flippant with this stuff because we get tunnel vision with it. We see it every day. We talk about it every day. And so we stop thinking about how things are from a consumer's perspective. Are you guys tracking with me? Okay. Yeah. So we always have to answer, why will this solve their problem? We're going to talk more about this when I speak on sales in just a little bit. But in every piece of marketing content that we make, it has to answer the question, why does this solve their problem? Because if it doesn't solve a consumer's problem, it's a waste of money. Because that's what consumers care about, is they care about solving their problem. They don't care about how long you've been in business. They don't care that your grandpa started the company. They want to know, how is this going to solve my problem? The last thing is this, is that very often in our marketing, and this is where it's tough, especially with traditional spends, because, you know, TV's really expensive. I, I always go back to TV. I mean, you could say the same thing for home shows, too. But TV's really expensive. If you're going to do TV right, it's going to cost you a ton of money. And the reality is that because TV spots are small, you know, maybe you've got a 10-second spot, a 15-second spot, whatever it is, you know, you try to cram every little bit of information, right? Because they need everything. Like, we got we to gotta tell them that we sell gas stoves. We've got to tell them we sell zero-clearance fireplaces and, and wood stoves. But don't forget about the energy trust rebates. And don't forget about the tax credit, right? And so, but here's the thing. And we, we talk about this with our sales team all the time. It's, it's kind of a running joke. But in your marketing, every time that you give a consumer a new piece of information, you're handing them a bowling ball. Think about that picture, OK? How many bowling balls can you hold at a time? All right, I mean, so like maybe one. Like you can hold a bowling ball. I, I can hold maybe two. But if someone hands me a third bowling ball, and like, it's not going to be a good picture. Now, here's the thing, though, is that if you're messaging, is not crystal clear and simple. Not only are you handing a customer five bowling balls, but you're covering them all in Vaseline when you hand them to them. This is happening with your consumers. So with all of our marketing, we have to step back and always remember to speak at that one or two. We always have to answer, why is this going to solve their problem? And we're going to speak more on that in just a little bit. But we also have to remember, never give them too many bowling balls. And that goes back to us, because like, we're BTU heads, right? We want to tell them all about like every single feature the fireplace has, and oh, but it does this. It's got this great turndown rate, and then it's got a light kit. And the reality is, what you're doing to your customers, they can only handle one or two bowling balls. So, so your job in your marketing is to target customers, and you got to target their problems, and you got to figure out, okay, if this is my customer's problem, what are the two bowling balls I can give them that are going to move the needle? Because they're not going to be able to handle more than that. And this is kind of how it is, you know, when you're given a sales presentation, is that. If you talk to a consumer and just start blasting them with, you know, seven features that this fireplace has, the customer maybe retains one. 
maybe one, you know? So rather than just blast them with seven and they don't remember any of it or they halfway remember one, it'd be way better to engage their problem, figure out what their problem is, and let's pick two bowling balls that are really gonna move the needle and are really gonna knock down those pins and let's hit them hard with that and make sure that they understand it. Is that fair? Yeah. Yes. And that's not through routines or anything else, but it is just about being knowledgeable and personable and things like that. So that's yep. on a whip. Even a simple website might not get that. You might try to get more information about your personality or your, uh, your culture. Yep. That's a really good point. And that, that actually trans transitions well into this next piece, which is sales. You know, and sales and marketing are like cousins. I mean, they're so, they're, they're pretty connected. Um, everything I've talked about so far, really is, is having to do with marketing, right? So how are you positioning yourself online in you know, your home shows, in your TV ads, in your print, you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, whatever type of advertising that you do and marketing that you do. Um, but you're right that, that you do need to build trust. That r the reality is people are not gonna make a multi-thousand dollar purchase from you if they don't trust you. I mean, there's too many other options that they have. So yeah, you're right, we have to build trust for sure. Yeah, Taylor. I'm gonna go back to reviews. That's the number one way you build trust yep. online today. So you can build trust online. If, they're, if you've got a bunch of really good reviews, it's amazing how people will come in and they feel like they know you because they've read about mm -hmm. your service. Yeah, I think you have more credibility than by the time you get them in the yeah. door. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And the, and the, the flip side works too. If you have bad reviews, they're not coming. Yep. No matter how good you Yep. And yeah. There are people that come into the store that are based on competition and they're so reviewed that they're not going to have trust with you or something like that. So it's, it's not that they have trust when they come in. They come aware of you, but they're based on an overall. Yeah. That's so when they're trusted, they just throw them all over. That's a good point. Now, we'll get to pressure in a second because I think it's okay for the pressure in a showroom to be turned up. I think that's okay. Now, there's, there's ways to tactfully and carefully do that, but we'll get there in just a second. But you're right, I mean, if you think about the journey of a customer, most people, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but most people that I know, most friends that I have, don't go to fireplace shops for fun when they have nothing to do on a Saturday. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the reality is that people are living in a crazy digital world where there's not enough hours in the day, they're being pulled in a million directions, and you know, a lot of our stores are hard to find. I know that mine are, mine are super hard to find. So if it takes, you know, number one, time that they don't have, They've looked on a website, they've, they've you know, looked at reviews and they've trusted us enough to drive in, like, it's a pretty serious customer. We'll, we'll hit on that a little bit more in a bit. But yeah, with marketing, just to round it out, I mean, we gotta keep it simple. We gotta keep marketing so simple. And, and I would just urge you guys that, you know, everyone's hurting for money, everyone's hurting for focus and for time. Um, I'm not joking, website simplification, in my opinion, will yield the highest return for the least amount of money, anything you can do marketing-wise. And I would argue that, um, you know, tracking is, will yield a huge return, but that's hard. It's gonna take some time and some buy-in, but tomorrow you could get with the person on your website, you could come up with some basic, simple sentences about what you do that again passes that five second test, right? What do you do, how does it make someone's life better, and what do they need to do to buy? That's very, very easy to do. So moving into sales, um, and this is gonna be interconnected with marketing, like I said, but the reality is that you can win in spite of mounting competition from the web. I mean, the reality is that we all have competition and that things have changed. I mean, at least for me, I mean, I've been doing this for 14 years. I mean, a little while, and I've seen some change. And I'm sure that, you know, the people that have been doing this for twice as long as me have seen a heck of a lot more change. But as much as things have changed, I'm convinced, and, and it, you know, we, we can talk all we want about <clears throat> Amazon and the web and e-commerce, and there is a time and place for that. And if we audit our own behavior, we probably all indulge in those things, right? Is there anyone here that doesn't buy stuff on Amazon? Okay, Tom. <laughs> but almost everyone buys stuff on Amazon, right? Most of us probably have Netflix. Some of us may have even canceled our cable bill, right? Because, I mean, Netflix is easier, it's convenient, it makes sense. And I don't think that that's bad. I mean, it does put pressure on us, but I would actually argue that we are in a position to do, to do more with less and actually win exponentially um, more business than we could have 10 years ago without the internet. So I'm gonna argue for that when it comes to sales. Um, this is a stat that came out in Hearth and Home in January 2018 that 
of hearth retailers believe that the internet has negatively affected their business. I saw that stat and my jaw dropped. <laughs> and I see some people shaking their heads here, but like, it's just, that's not true. I mean, the reality is like, if you have a website, which I pray that all of you do, right? If you have a website, and if someone can go to Google, Google Maps and punch in fireplace store and find your business, then I would argue that the internet has helped your business with you doing very little more than, I mean, a phone book ever could have, more than anything 10, 15, 20, I guess the internet was around 10 years ago, but more than anything 20 years ago could have. I mean, we have all been radically helped by the internet. The question is whether we're leaning into that and capitalizing on it, because even though the web can help us, the web does bring complications the way that the, any change in the landscape brings complications. Yeah, Danny? Yep. Yeah, 100%. I mean, the, the data's kind of crazy, but basically the, the data says that people on average do 24 hours worth of research before ever walking into a hearth store. Um, 24 hours worth of research. So generally speaking, when people are coming into your store, now they, you, know, you may not like the way they're educated, they may be wrong about some stuff, but they've been doing research. Um, but they've been doing research. Yep, absolutely. And the sales game changes because you become... You are still a teacher, but in a lot of ways you're a coach. We're going we're to get there in a second when it comes to sales. Um, the biggest thing is this, is that we have to understand our value. So when it comes to competing in today's market, uh, B2B, that stands for business to business, that'd be like our distributors or manufacturers. B2C stands for business to consumer, that'd be our retailers. But there are value propositions we offer that are unshoppable. These are just some examples. So you know, if you're a B2C business, if you're a retailer, an in-home preview, design consultation, before and after notebooks, knowledge of industry trends, in-house installation, project management, those are value pieces that cannot be shopped online, right? Now, if you're in the B2B world, business coaching. If you're a rep, you should be in business coaching relationships with your customers. Sales training, complete to promise records, warranty percentage, technical support, quarterly sales seminars. These are just examples of things that bring unshoppable value. And if you double down on those value points, you're gonna win. When it comes to selling though, especially in today's market, we have to stop being the hero. I think I talked about this a little bit last year, but if there's one thing that you get out of today, I hope it's this, is that we have to stop being the hero. And here's the example of that, is that so many businesses, going back to the fact that, especially in our industry, I mean, there's a lot of credibility to what the people in this room have done. I mean, our industry is full of entrepreneurs, people that have a vision and go out and get it people that know how to rally a team, a sales force around them. I mean, there's a lot of credibility to that, but the danger is that we make ourselves the hero of the story. We beat our chests about, I, I'm the best. I've been doing this for 30 years. Yeah, those guys don't know anything. I, I got the best products. I sell the best stuff, right? And here's the thing is that there's not room for two heroes in a story. So if you think about this from a customer's perspective, when a customer wakes up in the morning, they've got their own dreams, their own aspirations, their own vision for life, and buying a fireplace is not one of them. Right? I mean, it's not. It's not one of them. So when they come in and they hear you talking all about your company story and we've been doing this for forever and I'm the best and you're going to be so lucky that you worked with, I mean, it's, it doesn't work. And I, I give this example. So, so say that you wake up in the morning and you're going to mow your lawn, right? I mean, it's a Saturday morning. So you're going to mow your lawn outside and your lawnmower breaks. You're like, gosh, darn it, my lawnmower broke. Okay, so you, you, know, you get in the car, you drive down to the hardware store, right? Now, when you woke up that morning, you weren't wanting to go buy a lawnmower, right? If my lawnmower breaks, I'm not thinking like, oh, I'm so glad I get to go, like, you know, there's a problem that you have that has altered your course and forced you to take this route. And that's where our customers are when they come to us, okay? So now imagine this, your lawnmower's broken, and so you go to the hardware store, and you're sitting there trying to find the right lawnmower, but you don't, I mean, how often do you buy a lawnmower, right? How do you know what you should pay? How do you know it's good? How do you know it's bad? And then the salesperson just starts, you know, shoving down your throat. Well, we've been doing this for so long, and we've got the best lawnmowers, and my grandpa started this company, I'm, you know, What's going on in, in your head at that point is you're saying like, dude, I'm, I'm glad about your grandpa, but I gotta get a lawnmower. Can you get out of my way so that I can find someone to help me, right? There's not room for two heroes in the story. When we compete with our customer for being the hero, what the customer says in their head is, well, I'm a hero, and apparently you're a hero. That's great, but you gotta get out of my way because I gotta find someone to help me with my problem. That's what happens. We are so guilty of being the heroes. 
manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. We love to beat our chests about that. But what we need to become is we need to become the trusted advisor. So here's three scenarios that I'm going I'm to play out, and they're, uh, you know, they're kind of silly, but I think, that, I think that there's a little bit of truth in all of them. So this is going to go back to that financial uh, advisor example that I was talking about earlier with you know, the TV guy and everything. But so imagine that, imagine that you're going to be starting to set some money aside for retirement, right? You know in theory that you should. You've got this percentage of your budget allocated for it, but really you, you don't know what to do. You, you need to, to find someone to help you with it, right? So your problem is that I'm setting aside money and I don't know how to grow it so that I can retire comfortably, right? That's, that's your problem. So imagine that you go to financial advisor number one. And they really relate to you, right? I mean, they connect with you. They're, you know, I like the Blazers. This financial advisor likes the Blazers. We're talking about our families. And I just, I get this really good feeling about them, right? And so, uh, so it comes down to it. And I say, hey, I'm, you know, this is awesome. It's a, you know, it's a, it looks like a great partnership. And I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out how to grow my money. And he looks at me and goes, oh, man, I'm trying to figure out how to do the same thing. <laughs> right? I mean, like, you know, you're sure, you know, we, we really connected. But, like, I really actually need a sense of authority to invest my money. Like, if you don't have that sense of authority, like, I don't, I don't think we're going to, like, we might go to the bar afterwards, but we're not going to do business together, right? Okay? So advisor number two. You know, so uh, I w if I had to guess, I think that we all know someone like this in our industry. And uh, if you don't know anyone, it's, it's probably you. We can talk about that afterwards. <laughs> but uh, so you go, into, you go into advisor number two, and you, say, you start to tell them, hey, you know, I'm, I'm trying to invest my money. I've done some research. And, and they just say, you know what? Your research doesn't matter. All that stuff on the internet is stupid. It's just it's not right. Now, I've been doing this for forever. Just don't, you know, don't even ask me any questions. Just if you invest the money, I'll grow it. You don't worry about it. It's just all me, right? I don't know about you guys, but I'm not investing my money with someone like that, right? All authority, no empathy. There's been zero connection on the personal level. But if you go to a third advisor, and you think about this, I think that there might be something strategic in what I'm saying here. But imagine that you go to your, imagine you go to your third advisor, and you're talking to them about your situation, and they look at you and they say, you know what? You know, I, I get that you're trying to grow your money. In fact, you know, when I was a little kid, our family was trying to grow our money as well. My parents didn't have a lot, but they were looking to invest what they had. Believe it or not, my dad actually started investing and had a ton of success. So he started this business and has helped hundreds of families manage their money. I've been doing the same thing, and I know I can help your family. Right? Who are, who are you going to invest with? It's an easy question, and I'm, I'm setting you guys up for it. But the reality is that we have to become a trusted advisor for our customers, and that takes two attributes. It takes empathy and it takes authority. Not one or the other, but both. <coughs> You need to have someone that relates and says, I've been there before. I know what it's like to be cold in my house. I know what it's like to have a fireplace not work. You know, you have to relate on that level. But you know what, Mrs. Jones? We can help you with this. I've, act, I, I've helped 100 families like you, and I know that we can make you warm, right? You have to have that combination of empathy and authority. But what we want to become is we want to stop being the hero and become the trusted advisor. That's our 100% goal. Be the advisor. And this is what it takes to do that. It takes three things. Number one is only talk about your business as it relates to solving your customer's problem. You are only allowed to talk about your business when it directly corresponds to solving your customer's problem. So you're the best installer in town. Great. Oh, you've been doing this for 30 years? Awesome, right? Oh, oh you, you have the best, you make the best fireplaces in North America? Wow. We have to save those stories to tell our kids at the dinner table because our customers don't care. They do not care. We are only allowed to talk about our business when it corresponds to solving their problem. Because the only reason a customer is in our store is to solve a problem, right? So if, if we're sitting there yakking to them about your grandpa from 30 years ago, and it has no correlation to the customer's problem, just wasting time. And the customer's saying, hey, can you get out of my way so I can find someone to help me with what I need? But you know, think about this. So, so uh, say that your company does um, design consultations, right? So you, know, you listen to a customer and you say, oh man, yeah, I get, I get all the choices out there are, are difficult. But you know what? We actually have an in-house designer that will come out and meet with you to work on your project together so that design is going to be really simple. Do you think that would make a difference with a customer? I mean, that stuff makes a difference. And you've actually talked about your business, but you've done it in a way that solves the customer's problem. Right? So if you're a, a manufacturer's rep or a distributor rep, you know, Sure, you can talk about all the models of fireplaces that you have and all the BTUs that you burn and you know, whatever else you want to talk about. But think about this. You know, what, if, what if you went to a dealer and said, 
you know, I, I get that you've been burned uh, in the past by early buys. And that's a lot of risk to hold on to that kind of inventory without being sure of what the future holds. So we've actually put together a program to help a business like yours to have more cash flow so that you can capitalize on uh, changing trends. Do you think that would make a difference? As opposed to saying, I've got five new models of fireplaces, which one can we load up in the barn, right? You're only allowed to talk about your business as it solves a customer's problem. The next one is that we have to treat our customers like they're the hero of the story. And this is something that's really interesting when it comes to treating customers like they're the hero. It takes a big ego to do that. Right? Now sometimes we can get really down on egos. And I guess I, guess I, should, I, guess I should rephrase that. Not a big ego. It takes a strong ego. Do you guys know the difference between a big and a strong ego? I'll give you, I mean, if you guys want to see what a big ego is, we can watch the presidential debates and see, you know, a couple of big egos going at it. But a strong ego is someone that doesn't need the limelight and they can actually step aside and let someone else occupy that space. The more that we can do that and treat the customer like they're the hero, not us, it's not about us, it's not about our business, it's about solving the customer's problem, the more that we're gonna start to win. And lastly is we have to call the hero to action. In my experience, and I say this humbly because I've been there too, our industry has a lot of good information givers and mediocre salespeople. We're great at information. Very rarely do you see companies where that translates into good sales skills. And it all comes down to a call to action. So if you think about this, right? This goes back to the financial advisor picture. So I've gone into the financial advisor. I've gotten the education that I need. They've put together a path for me. They said, hey, Tim, you know, this is where we're going to invest. We're going to do it for this long. And we think that you can expect a X percent return on your investment. Well, we'll see you later, right? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't do anyone any good. It's been a waste of their time. It's been a waste of my time. What makes a difference is them saying, Tim, this is a great plan. Do you want to get started on it today? We have to call the hero to action. It's, it's the step in the, in the hero's journey. When we've become the trusted advisor, we've identified the pain point or the problem that our client has. We've advised them through empathy and authority to say, hey, I've been there before, but we have a solution for you. And actually, this is what that solution is we have to call them to action. Do you want to go ahead with it? For me, I am a, I'm pretty relentless with this because I'm fine with a little higher bit of pressure in the showroom. I think it's fine. People are not coming in to see you on accident. They're coming in on purpose, right? The most frustrating thing for people is to feel like, how do I even know what I'm supposed to get, right? They didn't even quote me. They didn't even ask me for this. You know, I've literally had people call me and say, can you just come to my house? I need to figure out how much this thing costs. And I'll go, you bet, I'll be there in an hour. I mean, seriously, like people, they want to be called to action. It's the reason that they're starting this process. And this is a, it's a, it's a story that I tell. It's a true story. I had, I had a, a, a young friend call me a little while ago, and he liked this girl. And so he's, uh, you know, he's telling me he, he likes her so much, but he, he's beating around the bush, and he, you know, he's, he's trying to get, go on a date with her. But he's talking to her, and he's, been, he's like, oh, uh, do, do you, you like coffee? I, you know, I, I like coffee. Do, do you ever drink coffee? Sometimes co coffee is good. And it's like, it's kind of creepy. <laughs> I mean, I, how, would you, how, would you, how would you feel if that's how someone's talking to you? And so he called me, he's asking for advice. And I was like, dude, here's what you got to do. You got to call this girl up and you got to say, hey, I really like you. And I want to get to know you better. Can I buy you a cup of coffee on Saturday? He did it. And they're still together to this, to this day. But don't be creepy with your customers. Don't be <laughs> creepy with them, right? So you're, uh, yeah, this, this fireplace is it's this many BTU, and I, I think we could install it pretty good, but I, I don't want to I don't want to pressure you, you know. We make the excuse, well, I don't want to be too I don't want to be too salesy. That's what we say. But this doesn't sound salesy, it sounds like you're not confident in your solution. Customers need to know that you're confident in your solution because they're spending 5,000 freaking dollars with you, right? I mean, like, we should be confident. We're putting a fire in their house on purpose, right? I mean, we better show some expertise and we better show some confidence, but we have to call the hero to action. I would beg and plead with you to work with your sales teams on calling the hero to action. It doesn't always mean that they throw down their wallet right there, but there's always a next step in the sales process. We have to make it easy. You know, in today's, uh, just today's landscape where there's so much marketing, there's so much advertising, um, we are in a situation where speed and convenience equal expertise. Anyone that's bought on Amazon knows that. 
I mean, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I'll never stand out in the rain again and call a cab, right? I never thought I'd do that 10 years, but I mean, who does that? I'm, why would I stand out in the rain when I can call a cab, know exactly the price I'm going, you know, I mean, I'm just going to call it from inside the restaurant and then walk out there once the, once the car comes. So the reality is that we have to make it easy for customers. If we don't make it easy for them, they're not going to buy or they're going to go elsewhere and do it. And the reality is this. I would challenge everyone here, and I'm challenging myself too, this is absolutely true for me, is that your company loses more jobs to indecision than competition. Your company loses more jobs to indecision than competition. We need to make it easier for people to buy from us. So this is where it starts. It starts with easy pricing number one. I don't know if you guys have read many manufacturers price books, but for me, I feel like I need a degree in biblical Greek to read most of them. Is that fair? Okay. If it's that hard for me and my sales team to price out a customer, it's going to be pretty difficult for them to understand it and be patient enough to get that proposal. We have to make it so easy. And, and you know, we can complain about it all that we want, but the reality is, you know, I can book a flight to Europe and back from my phone in less than five minutes, and I would expect that any business I go to, the pricing is pretty similar to that. You know, you need to be able to give customers a quote in less than five minutes. And if you can't do that, you're losing money. I would say that one of the best investments you can make, this is a hard investment. It doesn't cost much besides your time, but it is hard. But I would invest in custom pricing. You know, you don't want your business to be like a used car lot where every person you talk to gives a different price. You, you, you don't want that, right? I mean, when you go to the car lot, what kind of, it doesn't give you consumer confidence in what you're buying, right? So you need some standardized pricing that's customized for your company, and your salespeople need to know what discount levels or deals or however you want to want to put it your salespeople need to know that in real dollars and not margin points if you tell a salesperson hey you've got one and a half percent to work with or two and a half percent or ten percent you know you pick the percentage and they're sitting there in front of a customer right and don't have a calculator that's going to be tough to do so you need to make custom pricing tools with real world numbers that are uniform so any customer can talk to any person at any time and they're going to get the same price on the product the unified consumer experience and that actually gives customers confidence in buying from you looks like it makes you look like you're a professional company we all need to have a sales process as well um, as much as I try to pretend like this doesn't exist, the reality is that there's still a little bit, little bit of the Wild West in my company. And I would imagine that there's a little bit of the Wild West in yours too. Um, I think some of that's all right, but there's usually too much Wild West in our companies. And we have to have a consistent and unified customer experience, and that starts with the sales process. So if your company doesn't have a sales process, I can guarantee as a leader that you are either having to micromanage or your customers are having a bad experience because there's not a uniform system to give the consumer the same good, awesome experience that you want them to have with your brand. So there needs to be a sales process. And I've, I've heard people say, you know, I've heard people say, well, Tim, my people are naturals. When I hear that, I think your people are dangerous. <laughs> I mean, seriously. There's nothing more dangerous than a salesperson without a system that thinks they've got it all figured out. There's nothing more dangerous than that. It's a lot of dead bodies to clean up along the way. So you have to have a sales process. And the cool thing is, for a lot of you guys, you probably already have one. It's just not documented. But think about what you do and think about what works. What's the consumer experience that you want? And document this in a process. Teach it to your team and make them repeat it until they are so sick of it that they're waking up in the night screaming about it. I mean, seriously, they need to live and breathe this sales process because what you're doing is you're painting lines on a basketball court. If you think about this, you know, if you, uh, if you go to the park, and there's a basketball hoop, and you start dribbling around and just messing around, you know, that's fine. But there's a difference when you go to the Rose Garden and you see paint on the court. There's people that know how to play within those lines. When you establish those lines for your team, your salespeople will be stoked. They will rise to the occasion to play ball within it. And that structure of a sales process will actually start to give them freedom to create. And it will actually free up your time from having to micromanage because you can actually implement a process and a procedure that's scalable and repeatable. The last part of making it easy is being clear and not confusing, right? All the time we talk about BTUs, zero clearance fireplaces, insert, framing spec, hearth clearance. I mean, it just doesn't mean anything to consumers. And the reality is, if, like, I think about this. You should talk to everyone like you're going to a barbecue with them. So if you, know, if you have a barbecue at your house and a friend comes over and they're like, oh, Tim, dude, this fireplace is awesome. I would never look at them and say, yeah. 
well, this thing, it, it's 35,000 BTUs an hour, and actually heats about 1,350 square feet of my house. In fact, it's got an IPI intermittent pilot ignition system, and it, it turns down 50%. I mean, you, you never talk to a friend that way. Why would you talk to a customer that way? Right? I mean, I would, I would probably be like, oh, thanks. Dude, my house used to be so cold, but we're so warm now. Look at how awesome this thing looks. I mean, again, we need to speak at a 1 or a 2. We can't talk at a 9 or a 10 or even a 6 or a 7. Everything has to be a 1 or a 2. And I would highly encourage you guys to work this through with your sales team. Work this through with them because we are not as clear as we think we are. Once you start to look at it and measure it, you're going to start to see how confusing you are. And I'm pointing the finger at myself. We're going to fly through this. And I apologize that we're going so fast, but there is going to be some time for Q&A. Yeah. We, we can agree to disagree. And if you don't, you overpriced it. Yeah. Each customer is unique. Yep. And that they have to know as well. Yep. And I want to learn your situation. I want to get to the thing that fits and works perfectly for you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Every situation is different. Every customer is different. There, if you have a sales process, though, you can build into your process the right questions to ask the checkpoints of information that you need. And I'm telling you, it is possible to quote a customer in any situation in less than five minutes. I'm just, I, it, it's possible. And there are situations where you pad your pricing. But, you know, but think about this from a customer's perspective. And this goes back to like, we just don't have as much time. I mean, it goes, it goes back to if you're trying to buy that lawnmower, would you rather go drive to seven different places to maybe save $25, or would you rather just have a company that just says, hey, this is exactly what it is, this is when I can deliver it, should we just get that going so you don't have to shop around? I mean, again, it goes back to in the age that we're in, speed and convenience win every time. And people will, people will pay for value, because there's value in that speed and convenience. And, and I would argue that, again, there are different customer types, different mentalities, but it goes back to the 80-20 rule. I'd say 80% of customers would rather it be easy then maybe save $50 or $75 or $100 and waste three weeks of their time going to seven different dealers and waiting for three different people to come out. That's, that's my thought. We can talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, employee retention, though. So once, once we have a system of marketing that's really simple and clear, we've got a sales system in place that's going to help us win. The key is we've got to retain employees because employees aren't growing on trees. They really need to be grown because you're probably not going to find many transplants. Um, we have to retain employees, but the cool thing with this is that if they understand your marketing, they understand your messaging, and they understand your sales process, they will pay huge dividends for you and become brand ambassadors. The first thing I would say when it comes to employees is that you have to set expectations and goals. This goes back to clarity, and Taylor talked about this, and Carter talked about this, that we have to have clarity in what we do, and I would say step one with employees is saying, these are the expectations of your job. If you can do these things, you're going to win. If you don't do these things, we're going to have problems. But setting clear expectations for employees, and I mean, I try to do it with a new hire, but, but even with the people that you have on your staff, go back and write up a job description and go over it with them and say, is there anything on this that you don't understand or that's, you know, that's difficult for you that I can help with? But if you don't line that out, it's like a marriage. There's so many unsaid expectations and undiscovered roles that happen. And in so many businesses, how much frustration is there that people have had for years when just a little bit of clarity would have helped? So step one is that we have to set expectations and goals. Zig Ziglar is famous for saying, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So if you don't set expectations, and if those expectations don't turn into goals for your team, yeah, you'll hit your goal because I mean, you're, not, you're not going for anything. You're just going to be sitting there treading water. There's a crazy statistic out there that says this. Um, if you set goals for your people, this is a big study that was done, the goals in monetary incentives and workers' performance, this is back from 2012, but they found that setting goals for team members increases productivity by 14% even when compensation is not tied to it. 
So even when your comp is not tied to it, to set goals for your team on average will increase their productivity by 14%. What if you could grow close rates and sales and everything by 14% just by setting goals for your people? And this is the crazy thing with goals too, is that as you start to set goals, people start to get hungry. They start to get excited. When there's a scoreboard in place to say, I know what success looks like because there's been clear expectations for me. I know what it means to win because this is my goal and I have the power to go out and do it you will be blown away at how your people will go to the wall for your company. Any questions about that? As we set goals and as we give clear expectations, the next step is that we have to give our power away. And this is something that I'm really big on is that my job every day at work is to work myself out of the job. I want to have the day that I come into work and the team goes, what are you doing here? We don't need your help. You can just go find something else. I mean, like that's my dream, right? And I would hope that your guy's job as a leader is to empower your people to be so successful and to make so much money that they have to fire you or go find something else for you to do, right? I mean, that's what we all want. It's like we all want people that can take initiative. But even though we want that, how often is it that we don't give power away because we could do it better? You know, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy when you look at it that way, right? Well, I would give power away, but I could do it better. So therefore, I don't give power away, but then I can't retain employees, and then I have to do more what happens. There's a really good quote, and actually uh, I heard Carter and Taylor talk about this uh, a couple months ago on their podcast, but this quote is a couple hundred years old, and it says, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. So if you can teach your people, you know, what does that vision look like? How can you cast a vision for them that inspire, they'll build the ship, right? I mean, you, you, likewise, you could be the micromanager that says, okay, you go get the wood, you go get this, you go get that, you go, but like, you're never going to retain anybody doing that. But if you can give people a vision that's bigger than you and give them the tools to succeed, dude, it's crazy what happens. As you're looking to grow brand ambassadors, one of the keys also is to meet regularly with your people. This goes back, remember how I said that website simplification is like one of the lowest cost things you can do that's going to have the highest impact on your business? This is another one. Team meetings. Now, these are costly. You can add up the amount of hours that are in a meeting, and, and it does get expensive. But I guarantee that this is one of the easiest things you can do to start to move the needle with your company. On a regular basis, have team meetings. These meetings are going to energize your people. They're going to clarify direction. You know, when you can get together with your team and say, this is where we've been, this is where we're going, this is how we're going to get there, people like that clarity. That clarity starts to make sense. It'll buy you credibility as a leader, but it'll also allow you to keep your finger on the pulse of your company. You know, I've worked for a lot of companies where people have not had their pulse on the company because, you know, maybe people are afraid of the boss, the boss is distant, the boss isn't there often, whatever it is, but you want to have your finger on the pulse of your company and regular meetings are going to let you do that. In your regular meetings, you're also going to be able to talk about goals. So for instance, with my team, we have two goals. That's it. We have two goals. Any more, any more than, I mean, I, I can never handle any more than three, but even two is like all we can do. So we have two goals. And literally every week, we just say, hey, here's the goal. It was the same goal as last week. Here's how we did. Here's where we're going. What are we going to do this week about it, right? You know, that kind of clarity focuses people. And focused workers are productive workers. And focused workers are energized workers. But not just team meetings. If you want to grow brand ambassadors for your company that go to the wall for you, coaching meetings have to happen. And the agenda is really simple. But I'm not joking. Every single person in your company should be getting poured into on a regular basis with coaching meetings. Maybe you don't have the capacity for it, but there have to be other leaders in your company that can do this. Every single person. On a regular basis, you have to ask five questions. Number one, how have things been? And that can go any direction, right? Work, personal, just how have things been? Number two, how are you doing with your goals? Yeah, both work goals and personal goals. And I would hope as you start to develop this culture of goal setting and going and getting it with your team, your team is going to be stoked when they start to win. And you can actually start to help them set personal goals, right? Maybe it has nothing to do with your business, but they want to become a doctor someday or they want to you know, go to Alaska. We had a guy years ago that he always wanted to go to Japan. So literally in our meetings, I would talk to him, dude, how's it going for Japan? I know you had a savings goal. Have you been able to plug away at that savings goal? I mean, that starts to build you credibility. Check in on their goals, personal and work. Number three, is there anything I can be doing to help get you there? And, you know, we can talk about this with work. We can talk about this with personal. But is there anything I can be doing as a leader to help get you there? 
The next one is critical, and you need to be able to take some criticism. But is there anything I can be doing better for you as a leader? That humility and vulnerability will buy you credibility with your people. Is there anything I can be doing better for you as a leader? And believe me, your people will tell you. And that's okay. You need to listen. And you need to change. The last one is action items and encouragement, right? So you go through this meeting. There's going to be stuff that comes up with personal goals, with work goals. Um, you know, you've got feedback as a, as, a, as a leader. And you can put that together and say, okay, hey, thanks so much for this meeting. You know, I'm going to go to work on what you said about this. So glad that you're making progress on your, on your, uh, you know, your, your quarterly goal. And on your personal goal here, um, you know, you said that you're going to work on X, Y, and Z. And I'll ask you about it in a couple weeks, right? It's not hard. But this actually starts to mold people into your company's image. And, and so often, you know, we can throw, I, I don't like the term employees, I like the term team members. But we can be so quick to throw team members under the bus and just treat them like they're garbage and they're dirt and they don't want to work and they're lazy, right? But you look at this. I mean, Stephen Covey said this. He says, treat a man as he is and he'll remain as he is. But treat a man as he can and should be and he will become as he can and should be. Right? Is it any wonder that people live into the stereotypes that you speak over them? This doesn't mean that everybody works out. There are situations where you have to fire. But I would argue that so much talent leaves our industry and goes other places because people are not invested in. And when people are invested in, man, they'll go to the wall for your company. And be becoming, you know, the, the, really the goal is that, is that as, they, as they start to be formed in this image and they start to be formed into um, understanding personal goals and clarity and vision, they're going to start to get some self-confidence that you've never seen before. They're going to start to believe in themselves and think they can go out and achieve stuff. I had someone last year come up to me after I talked. I was talking about giving my power away and investing in people. And they said, yeah, but Tim, what can we do about it? They're, you know, they're just going to get so big and they're just going to leave us. I mean, the answer is maybe. Maybe. But would you rather invest in someone that's super productive for you, makes you a ton of money, you can give all kinds of authority and power to them, and maybe someday lose them? Or would you rather not invest in someone, have them be bad, suck out your payroll, and stay at your company? I would way rather have the problem of having great people that I've grown with a repeatable, scalable system that I can bring anybody into and just run them through the system. And yeah, maybe they leave someday. But if they leave, it's probably with my blessing because we've probably talked about this in the coaching sessions, right? I would way rather have that than someone that sucks that stays at the company. So we're short on time. And we're going to do more on this in the Q&A once this next break has happened. But I just want to encourage you guys with this, is that you can win in this changing landscape. I know that you can. And every single one of you guys, the fact that you're here means that you are wanting to invest in your company and in your people. Because stuff like this is important, but it's not urgent, right? I mean, it's important that we do stuff like this. It's, and I would argue that the money that, that this costs is nothing compared to the value and training that you and your team gets out of it. But a lot, most companies don't do this, right? They're so busy just sawing away at what they have that, I mean, I don't know. I, don't, I, I, think that, I think you're either living or dying. And I don't think there's much of an in-between. I think that stuff like this is investing in the life of your company. But where do you start? I mean, today we've talked about a lot. You know, we've talked about marketing. We've talked about sales. We're talking about employee retention. And the reality is that, for me, a number of years ago, I went to Expo, heard all this awesome stuff, wrote down a million pages of notes, came back, thought I could change the world. I couldn't. I was trying to, I was trying to boil the ocean. I couldn't do it, right? So where this starts is this starts with focus. And I'm going to tell this story. I know I'm short on time. But about, I don't know, four or five years ago, I had all these ideas. I was trying to change the world. And I, there was not traction the way that I wanted. So I had a friend from church. And we went and got some lunch. And this guy's job, before he retired, he has about 30 years on me. He's about 60, 61. But before he retired, his job was to invest billions of investor dollars with companies. Like, that's with a B, not with an M. Billions of dollars with companies. And it was his final choice where the money got invested. So he would literally interview, like, the CEO of Best Buy or of Starbucks, he, these high-level CEOs to determine if their leadership was a good investment for the portfolio of his company. He told me a funny thing, just as a side note. He said, if I found out they had a, they had a PhD, I would thank them for their time and leave. He said, PhDs can't focus on anything. You don't ever want to invest money with a PhD. But what he did say is he said, he said that there's a trait with CEOs that the best CEOs are never the smartest people in the room. The best CEOs are the people who have laser-like focus on the goal at hand and are constantly shepherding the rest of their company towards it. 
And I think that's true for us, is that we look at all these things of like, where do I start, right? I've got, I've got early buys, I've got sick time, I've got marketing. You know, there's all these different things. It's the never-ending whirlwind that's always there. And the reality is that it's going to be a game of focus that's the difference between winning and losing. And the focus companies are the companies that win. So where do you start? You can't do all this at once. Um, I would humbly submit to you to download my ebook. If you go to the website, itsfiretime.com slash roadmap, you're going to get a free download of a PDF. Uh, these are five executable steps to grow your company in the changing landscape. And I'll tell you guys, like, it's not hard. It's what we've talked about today. Number, like, number one, have you set clear expectations for your team? You know, number two, have you simplified your website? This is not rocket science. But what this is going to do is this is going to give you a roadmap to systematically work on. So you're not trying to boil the ocean at once, but you're saying, okay, here's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to set clear expectations for our people. And once we've done that, we're going to set some goals for them. You know, once we set some goals, then we're going to start doing some team meetings. Once we've done that, then we'll move into marketing, right? You can work your way down the list. And this is something that you can read in probably 20 minutes, but I'd encourage you, once you've read through it, you know, I would, I would take six months and go through it. And I, I'd give a month to each topic, maybe a month and a half to each topic. But this is something for me, again, these are not um, ethereal, cute points, but these are concrete steps that have more than doubled the size of our business in the last three years. Um, I'm not perfect. I'm a total work in progress, and honestly, most of this book has come out of my failure because, like, I might sound like I have some stuff together, but I guarantee, like, I fail fast and I fail often. And that's, I tell, like, my team members all the time, man, I am always trying stuff and I am crashing and burning, but it's okay. We test on a small scale, we fail often, and then we figure out what works. We just scale it and do it on a bigger scale, right? So anyway, I, I would encourage that. If you get a chance, it's a free ebook, uh, The Roadmap to Success. And uh, you know, my email's in there. Shoot me an email. Let me know how it's going for you. But I think that the reality is uh, we compete with each other in certain ways, but in a high tide, all the ships rise. And our industry needs a high tide. That's, that is really what we need right now. I think that, that if the industry was flooded with people looking at gas inserts, we'd all probably be a lot happier. So here's the thing. It starts today. We have to work proactively in our businesses. It's going to take focus. It's going to take dedication. But it's worth doing. And the best investment that you can start to make is to focus in on your business, simplify your marketing, and invest in your people. In our company, one of our core values, and again, what they talked about with core values is so key. Your team members should have an idea of what you stand for and what your core values are because it will empower them to start making decisions, right? We talk all the time that, like, as long as the decision my team makes is in line with our core values, then they have my green light and 100% backing for me to make that decision. If they can defend it with our core values, done. You don't even need to come talk to me. Just make the decision. Okay? But here's the thing. One of our core values is this. It's that our people are the source of our strength. Our people are the source of our strength. And we're all in that boat. We are nothing without our people. Right? If we lose a vendor, we'll go get another vendor. Right? You know, if a, if a, if a rig breaks down, we'll get another one but we are nothing without our people. They are the source of everything that we do. So in summary, you guys can win in the changing landscape. Sales is tough. Marketing is tough. Retaining employees is tough. These things say easy and do hard. But the reality of it is, like, this is worth investing in. There is more opportunity now than there has ever been, and I know that you guys can do it. So I hope that that's been encouraging for you. Um, I thank you for your time. And what I want to say, just to summarize this, is People don't buy from the companies that offer the best products and services. But people buy from the companies that are easiest to do business with. So our mission as retailers, as manufacturers, as distributors, wherever you are, our mission is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from us that there is no excuse not to. That's all I got. Thanks, guys.